In the holy name of Jesus, amen. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. According to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. The people were terrified of God. Do you have confidence to stand before God on the last day? Or are you more terrified that he may come tonight and find you not waiting in fear? Maybe you worry a bit that those secret sins that you hold in your heart will be found out. Do you wonder if God will see you for the fraud that you actually are? Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. Or perhaps you are of a different state of mind than those people remembering Horeb, Mount Sinai. Do you come tonight rather prideful, boasting of your goodness, your rightness, your law-keeping? Do you come before God this evening standing confident in your own works of charity and love? Do you come tonight before God relying upon your heritage saying, I am a child of Sherman Center and I have never been otherwise? Two different ways to approach God. One, asking God to leave out of fear that he may destroy you for who you are. Or coming before God, boasting of oneself, putting your confidence in your own righteousness. And so it has always been for the people of God. Either living in fear of God because of what he has demanded, or not fearing God because you found confidence in yourself. And that's if you believe in him at all, because, of course, that's the third position, to just outright deny God and go after false gods, which God's people have done, too. How does God want you to relate to him? Well, he does it this way. He makes himself known to you, and in the manner that he makes himself known, that teaches you how you ought to relate to him. So when God's people were wandering on the Sinai Peninsula, and as they were forgetting God, the God who had saved them in Egypt, had saved them from that bondage and slavery to Pharaoh and his host, God himself revealed himself to them in a way that would strike fear in them. Depart from me. Do not speak to me again, lest I die. Now, this is how he had related to their enemies. Remember, he had shown great signs and wonders to Pharaoh and their hosts, the ten plagues, the destruction of Pharaoh and all his soldiers in the Red Sea. He had struck fear and terror in the hearts of all of Israel's enemies. Word of what God had done to Pharaoh in Egypt had spread already to the promised land, even before the people arrived. He did, or he was known to Israel's enemies as a God, powerful and mighty, terrifying, bringing death and destruction. But the problem was that over, after he overcame the enemies, the external enemies, the enemies outside of Israel, then God came to work upon his own people, to overcome the enemies of sin and unbelief that were in the hearts of his people. And for that reason, God had his prophet come upon the mountain and commanded to him his law with all of its rules and regulations, comprehensive about one's whole life as citizens, 
rules about life in the church and rules about life in family, in the home. Just as he had struck terror in the hearts of his foes, let my people go, and when they refused to repent, he brought misery and death upon them. Now, in the same way, upon a mountain called Horeb, or also Sinai, with thunder and darkness and thick clouds, he did the same thing for his people. He commanded them to repent, and if they refused, there would be punishment, lest we die, they said. Thus they demanded God to be silent, to not speak to them anymore. They knew his commands, and as good and right and true as his commands are, they only saw in them their sin. They saw death, not life. That's the way God's law works. The law was not given to give life. Even while the law can guide your life, show you the way you ought to go, even while the law restrains evil, keeps evil from breaking out in this world, the law always, always accuses your heart of its sin. And so... The appropriate response of a sinner, then, is shut up, God. Put out your burning bush and go away from us because we'll die. And they're right. Even as Moses, as he came down from the mountain, even as he saw that they had molded that golden calf, he said, I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you. I was afraid that he would destroy you. Moses' own words. So, do you want to go to that mountain again? Or rather, would you say also, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I too die. The writer of the Hebrews, recording this event, says, you have not come to that mountain that may be touched and that that may not be touched and that was burned with fire. You have not come to the place of blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. That's not the mountain that you want to go to. That's still true today, as it was for those people. Maybe another way to say this is be careful what you wish for or rather what you ask God for. If this is the sort of God you want who tells you how you must act, what you must do, a God who is powerful and mighty, who devastates your enemies, who overcomes all evil and vice, be careful. Because the God who you want to meet your enemies in that way, the way of Moses, will meet you in the same way. And what he finds in you is someone who is captive by evil, whose only future is death, and who, as he says to the Pharisees, are not children of faith, of promise, but children of the devil. Now, if that sounds harsh, (laughs) that's precisely what God means when he says that you are sinners. Now, he says this to you, as he said it to the people of old on the, on the mountain. But he does not say it to hurt and to harm you, but rather that you would despair, not of God, but of yourself. That in faith you would not boast, you would find no confidence in your actions and deeds, not in your love, in your acts of charity, not in your heritage or your ancestry. God, by his holy law, always is tearing down your mountains of pride. He's wrecking those high places of self-worship. Your exalted self-esteem is made lowly. He does this so that you would fear, love, and trust in God and him alone, first commandment. 
But as the writer of the Hebrews said, we don't go to that mountain that may be touched and burned with fire to the blackness and darkness and tempest. At least we don't go there alone. God does not relate to you only in the way of the prophet Moses as lawgiver, with tablets of stone, with command, with law. Maybe you don't remember the next part of the story, but after Moses saw what the people had done, the golden calf, after he had burned it with fire and put it into the river and made them drink it, after he had cast those tablets of stone upon the ground until they were broken, that same Moses made intercession to God. He prayed for God's people. He prayed for those who had rejected his office as prophet and had rejected God thereby. He pleaded to God to have mercy and to restrain God's righteous wrath and devastation. He pleaded to God in the way that Abraham had pleaded to God to spare Lot and his family, to spare those cities. And just as God heard the prayer of Abraham, so God also heard the prayer of his prophet Moses, who interceded for the people. Spare the people. I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you. And God, yes, he is just, but he is also known to you as merciful. That's why he said in our, in our first reading, what they have spoken is good. They have said, don't talk to us anymore. And God says, that's good. It's good. Because I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among your brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak all that I command him. Now this is a promise that is fulfilled, as you might expect, in Jesus. Jesus is the prophet for whom the people pleaded. No more Sinai. And the one whom Moses interceded for. Jesus is the prophet who comes not in terror and might, not to cause fear and trembling, not to hurt and to harm, but who comes with grace and mercy to forgive, to redeem the people who have been devastated by God's word of law. As Philip said to Nathaniel, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, we have found him, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So this prophet like Moses who interceded for the people is named Jesus, who comes to blot out sins from God's ledger, to restore God's people, to bring, him back, bring his people back into God's presence, not lest they die, but lest they live, to bring peace and refreshment that is quite unlike any of that peace, anything that they experienced at Horeb on the day of assembly. That's our Jesus. But the problem, well, there's a problem, and it's this. We'd actually rather have a prophet like Moses, the lawgiver, than a prophet like Jesus, the forgiver. We actually love, in our sinful nature, to worry and to have angst over our sins, how God feels about us. In a fit of what we might call spiritual masochism, we even love to fear death. We seek day and night to avoid this last enemy to be defeated. And we even love to flirt with the devil and his demons and their temptations. And for all of this, we want a lawgiver Moses to come out and terrify us, to haunt us, to bring our sin to remembrance, to make our life miserable in a strange turn because we think that by this then we'll be motivated and encouraged and strengthened to make ourselves right before God. A lawgiver Moses who will shape us, bring us into shape, make us into shape so that God's pleased with us. But that's not the Christian faith. Not at all. 
You believe in Jesus, who is God, who comes to serve you, to save you, to redeem you, not you to make yourself right for him. He makes no demands of you. He is, does not come to you in the way of Sinai. But rather, he gives you everything that is needed to be saved. He even gives you the faith that is needed to trust in him. To trust that his death upon the cross of Calvary, his shed blood, is everything for salvation. And that's contrary to what we love, which is our flesh. We want God to love us because we've made ourselves right before God. But that's not what the law was given for. It was given to show us sin and to help us learn that God loves us in Christ Jesus despite how unlovely we are. And worse than that, Jesus knows how utterly upside down and backwards his salvation is to us. The true scandal of the Christian faith is that God allows himself to be rejected, to be scorned, to be mocked, to be denied, to be ridiculed, even to be crucified. That the Christian faith is not one that looks mighty and powerful. It's not about good Christian boys and girls behaving so that they can earn salvation presence from God. No, God wants to be found amongst sinners, confessing and being forgiven. Not in fear and terror, with commands and threats, with thunder and lightning like Sinai. He wants to be known by you in the midst of another day of thick darkness. That's Good Friday. He wants you to see his face there, not lest you die, but rather that you find in his death your life. And he makes himself known to you then in the midst of similar sorrow and distress. He makes himself known to you as you struggle with worry and anxiety. He makes himself known with you, in you, as you face suffering and death. His love is known to you in that he comes to save you, not you, save yourself. So the scriptures describe where we go, not in terms of Horeb on the day of assembly, not in terms of Sinai, but they say it this way. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. You have come to God and judge of all, to the spirits of just men who have been made complete by Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, by the sprinkling of blood that speaks of better things than Abel. You have come to Jesus, who forgives you. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen. Now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand to sing.